Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comms. This is a hot mess. What we have here are two 110-watt GE Orion mobile radios. Both have the scan control head, and one is a VHF and one is a UHF. The VHF split is 150 to 174, and the UHF is a 440 to 470, which is good because it's right in the ham band. These radios can be had very inexpensively. I paid $35 for both of these radios, and although most of the variations of these you're going to come across are going to be the wideband only versions of it, meaning that they will not operate on the narrowband channel. So they're obsolescent for Part 90 service, but for amateur radio service they're just fine. What we're going to do is provide a broad overview of the GE Orion radio. Here is our example high power GE Orion mobile laid out. We have our microphone, speaker, audio, accessory cable, control head cable, control head, power cable, our mounting trunnion for the drawer unit, and the radio itself or drawer unit. The radio drawer unit itself in inches is 11 by 7 by 2. It has one DB37 connector which is what interfaces to the control head cable. You have your DC power connector and you have a TNC RF connector for the antenna. Model and serial number information is on the opposite side of the radio from the heat sink. This is the control head. The control head on this particular one is known as a scan model. It has a two-line display. It has an on-off volume control potentiometer, channel selector switch, your microphone plug, uh, two rockers, and five push-button switches that are programmable. Microphone is of quality construction, otherwise unremarkable. The speaker is a typical 4 ohm remote mount speaker. It has a bracket and uses a Molex plug. This is the audio accessory or properly known as the extended options cable and it has two DB25 connectors at either end, a DB25 female at the end, that's the accessory end, and the DB25 male which interfaces with the back of the control head. There are also six pins that are programmable for audio features such as uh, push to talk, carrier operated relay, and you have the same functionality on this option connector here which is the DB25 female, which the DB25 female connector also provides an interface for programming a wide variety of tasks and it's important to remember this is not a programming cable in and of itself, it only provides a port. This is the high power speaker connector and it provides 15 watts of audio into a 4 ohm load. This is the control head cable. The control head cable is approximately 21 feet long. The DB25 end goes to the control head, the DB37 to the radio drawer unit, and like the option cable, it uses screws to secure it to the back of the accessory that it's plugged into. The yellow lead is an ignition sense lead. Uh, the radio does not come out of the box ready for ignition sense. If you desire to use such, there is a switch that has to be manipulated inside the radio itself to set that option up. Being that the radio is a used radio, our DC cable is just a pigtail, and you can see how the DC cable has these two female connectors here that are crimped to our leads. Our leads are of 6 gauge. There's no fear of voltage drop in that. And you can see it uses two screws to secure it to the drawer unit. To place one of these radios in service, take your DB37 connector and your DB37 connector in for your control head cable. Simply plug it in, secure your screws, take your RF cable, connect your RF cable to your TNC connector, pull your fuse on your power connector, and go ahead and hook up your power connector cable, and then secure the screws. On your control head, take your microphone, install your microphone, tighten up the screw, turn your control head around, take your control head cable, and plug it into the male side, secure this with these two screws, now take your audio accessory cable and taking the DB25 male end, put it on the DB25 female 
and then tighten these screws up to the back. Now take your speaker and your speaker connection and plug that in. Recheck your connections and reinstall your fuse for power. After installing your fuse and rechecking your connections, go ahead and turn the power on and voila, your radio is up and running. Transmitter is performing within specification. The receiver calls for 12 dB set at at 0.35 microvolts, and you can see that we're at 12 dB set at at 0.244 microvolts. So when you bring it up to 0.35, you can see that we're at 21, 22 dB of Senad. So receiver is performing well. One of the disadvantages of commercial Part 90 radios is that they are not keypad programmable. Uh, there are exceptions, of course, but for the most part, radios such as this are going to require some kind of a software application to program it, and the software is provided by the manufacturer. In addition to a computer and the software for programming, you will need some kind of a programming cable. And the programming cables for this, fortunately, this particular one here, this is one that you can purchase, and it essentially plugs into the DB37 at the rear of the radio and then you just plug your control head cable into the other side of it. The other end is a DB9 and the DB9 plugs into the back of your computer. Now my particular programming computer has a DB9 connector. Failing that you may be able to use a DB9 to USB adapter but your mileage will vary. These are the features that I've observed thus far with the GE Orion. Uh, the first is 100 plus watts of RF out. I mean, yes, the Spectra has a 100 watt version. You can get a Centaur or whatever, but this radio's got some things going for it that those radios do not have going for them, and they actually go for less money. Uh, it has a 10 dB receive preamp. It's selectable per channel, so that's something you can do in the software before you write to the radio. So it's not something you can switch on and off on the control panel or in the menu that I've seen thus far. It's 15 watts of receive audio. You won't have any problems hearing to receive audio in this radio in a very noisy environment. These radios are of excellent construction. I mean, look at that control head. I mean, this is metal. This is not plastic. It's rubber on the control knobs. The knobs actually use set screws to hold them in place. The body of the radio itself is all screwed together and uses torque screws. I mean look at that bracket. I mean these things are, are built like a tank. In that regard they far exceed anything that's available from an amateur radio manufacturer or especially the Chinese products that are so popular in today's market. They are Windows PC programmable. Uh, that, that may sound kind of silly but you have to consider that other radios of this vintage from other manufacturers are using MS-DOS as a uh, programming platform, so that does make a big difference. They're easy to interface to other equipment. That DB25 and the uh, six pin accessory pin on the extended options cable, uh, is, it's got a lot of capability built into it, so it's actually very easy to interface it to other equipment. It does have an alphanumeric display. Uh, it's two lines of eight characters and considering this is the main competition for this radio was the Motorola Spectra of the same vintage and this one here just had a single line display and this one here being of the uh, uh, system and group type of arrangement that's kind of interesting it's kind of grown on me. Uh, the scan list is very easy to edit the radios have a 250 plus channel capacity, which is nice if you decide you want to fill your radio up. Considering that, again, uh, its contemporary competition, being the Motorola Spectra, only had 128 channels. The radios are capable of PL and DPL selective signaling, and they also feature a couple of modes, which are GE proprietary modes, GE Star and T99. Uh, GE Star is similar to a Motorola MDC, and... T99 is essentially more of a selective calling, two-tone sequential signaling mode. 
uh, the utility of either of those modes if you were running a fleet of GE radios and you could exploit those modes that would certainly be useful but for to the typical individual operator I don't think you'll find them terribly useful. These are the features that were not observed in this series of radio. Uh, there's no provision for inverted DPL I could find. Uh, that's not really super useful to me, but uh, it may be to you. Uh, there's no MDC, meaning you can't run MDC 1200, and there's no provision for that. The radios are obsolete and not narrowband compliant. Some may be, your mileage may vary. Uh, these particular radios that I have here were made before 1996 and therefore are not narrowband switchable and they were never required to be such. One thing that I have observed is there is a smaller pool of know-how on GE radios and it's sometimes it's difficult and you really have to search to find specific answers to questions in a search engine that you may have on this equipment. One advantage if there is one to the uh, smaller pool of know-how is typically when you find someone who knows GE products. They've been a person who's worked on it professionally in the past and they typically really know their products and it's evident from reading what they write that they are well, well versed in their product lines. Stay tuned for these upcoming GE Orion videos. In part two we're going to do a do-it-yourself programming cable. You may have these items in your shop. I did to put it together and it works fantastic. And we'll also do a short tutorial on the Macom programmer software. In part three will be a two meter conversion of the VHF Orion. And we're going to bump it down to cover the two meter amateur band. And I've already done that as well. And it works great. It's just a matter of editing it. And considering that it does involve some manipulation of the software, I wanted to make sure that the software tutorial is out there before the conversion tutorial to prevent any confusion. In closing, I would like to encourage you to sally forth and save a radio. I hope this helps. This is Brad from Survival Comms. Till next time.